Well, hello, everybody. We're going to talk today about winery safety and the importance of taking care of yourself. Uh, this picture is particularly formative uh, to me. Uh, it happened while I was in Australia. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, as time goes on, but it's one of those situations that maybe couldn't have been helped. But we'll talk about my friend Angus here in a little bit. But I think it's just important to kind of set the stage of why we need to be self-aware and take extra special care of what we do in the wine industry. Quick disclaimer about this lecture. Um, there's some graphic content here. Um, I want to illustrate some purposes, and uh, if that requires some shock and awe, I think that's appropriate. And so we are going to drag up some uh, some real things that have happened to people, uh, talking about some of the hazards that are in here. And so you're going to see the, the potential of some of the things that you'll be working with in the cellar. Um, and the reason I say that is many of you have never worked in a production environment before. And I mean this really uh, simply is that if, if you've grown up um, in a you know, large urban area, generally for the most part, uh, you've lived more or less in a, a, a padded room. Um, and we all have um, in a way because we've been safe and protected from all kinds of things. And there's a great episode called Safety Third um, on Dirty Jobs that I recommend you watch. Um, but the idea is, is that there's a safety committee or somebody looking out for you all the time. And really the only person looking out for you is you. And most of the time when accidents happen, they're a result of unsafe behavior. So uh, there's a lot of things going on. There's going to be forklifts. We're working with heavy equipment and we're working with things that are not forgiving. And we don't have uh, safety and warning labels on absolutely everything. Uh, so you need to pay attention. You need to be careful and you need to be self-aware of a lot of things that are happening around you so that you don't get hurt. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want you to be discouraged by this lecture, it's for your benefit. We need you to think really about not only yourself, but the people around you and how your actions are going to impact them. Um, but lastly, I wanna clear this up. The wine industry is fantastic. You just have to be a little bit more self-aware than you're used to being, and you've gotta monitor yourself. And I'm gonna talk about some of those things you're gonna to need to do to monitor yourself to make sure you have a long, healthy, prosperous career in this industry. So the things we wanna talk about is we wanna talk about protection, uh, things that you need to wear, things you need to look at. Uh, we want to talk about winery hazards, both chemical and physical. Talk about cellar responsibility, alcohol responsibility, and uh, the fact that you should never drink while you're working. Um, this is a phenomenon that has always been fascinating to me, is that there are a lot of people in the wine industry that will just drink a few beers or drink some wine or drink whatever while they're at work. And um, I cannot object to that enough. And, and I think you'll find some conversions to that. And the reason we've seen some conversions really in Walla Walla over the last decade, we've had deaths, we've had people pass away. Um, if you ever get a chance to reach out to Marcus Raffinelli out at Lacole 41 or Marty Club, they'll talk about how they had a guy who was a driver for him and he was sneaking booze all day long and got ham boned on the job and was driving with a bunch of fruit and, and died in a car accident. And we've seen that happen over and over again. So the reality is alcohol plus working is you're gonna end up looking like this. So don't do it. Um, and it's just not, there's no room for it. Um, after you're done with your day, by all means, go for it. But during the day, while we're at work, uh, we just don't involve in, in any chemicals at all. And uh, I mean that very seriously. Marijuana as well, any intoxicating substance is going to lower your ability to have self-awareness. You've got to stay on top of your game uh, in order to maintain uh, a really safe work environment. And just having any extra mind-altering substances isn't going to help that. And this comes back to the safety basics. Um, and it's always about unsafe behavior. You know, very frequently we always see, uh, hear about people that, uh, you know, sue or looking for an opportunity to bring a lawsuit against uh, some establishment for whatever reason, because they tripped or they fell. People are always looking for an opportunity, but most of the time that lawsuit's thrown out because it wasn't the fault of the company, it was the fault of the person who ignored the don't step here sign, the, the ignored the, uh, you know, watch out for sign. Uh, and they just walked around it. And it's almost always that it's unsafe behavior that causes it, not necessarily the unsafe conditions. Now, in a wine cellar, we're going to have all kinds of hazards that are around us. But the thing is, is that we need to understand how to work around them. And, and the reality is, is that it's almost always unsafe behavior. And a lot of times we don't realize some of those behaviors and how dangerous they are. And so this is an illustration on the bottom here of how um, we talk about drinking and driving and how much it can really cause accidents. And we know how vilified drinking and driving is. It's terrible. 
Um, 50% of all highway fatalities are due to intoxicated drivers. Um, you know, people get sent up for a long time for drinking and driving. I mean, DUI is a no small thing to deal with. You know, you're talking a $10,000 fine plus, you know, basically a smear on your record for years. Um, and that's the best that'll come off. If you actually kill somebody, you're going to be in, in deep, deep trouble for a long time. But drinking and driving is a fraction as bad as reading an email or texting and driving. But let's also bring this on to the seller, to working in a seller. Remember how I told you that drinking in a cellar is not a good idea? And I think almost all of you will agree that walking around in a cellar where there's a wine press that can rip off your arm or a distimmer that could tear you up and suck you into it and end your life um, is not a good idea being drunk in those situations. Well, guess what? It's not a good idea to be staring at your phone, reading your email or texting your friend while there's a forklift behind you that can impale you with the forks. Um, put your phones away, step off the crush pad, text in a safe spot. Read your email in a safe spot. Do not do it while you're on the cellar floor in some sort of a place that there's a hazard. Now, I'm not against you using your phones in the cellar. By all means, do so. Just make sure you're pulled off to the side of the road. You're out of the way. You're not in a place where you can be hurt by someone else um, because you're going to be oblivious to the things going on around you. So again, these rules apply. We don't drink in a cellar. We don't text in a cellar. Um, we can do, uh, you know, data entry or something on our phone, but we have to do it in a lab or in a place where there isn't active work going on around us. All right, I want to talk about chemical hazards. And you're going to notice some asterisks next to all these is that each one of those that has an asterisk next to it is one that has almost killed me um, or seriously hurt me in one way, shape, or form in my, you know, 30-year career. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about those a little bit. But most importantly, what we want to talk about as we go through these chemical hazards, everything from asphyxiants to strong and weak, weak acids, strong bases, uh, to inhalants, uh, hydrogen peroxide, which in strong enough uh, concentrations will burn you, Oxidaz uh, oxidizing agents, uh, which again, hydrogen peroxide fits into, um, flammable liquids. Uh, there are also things around gasoline and diesel. You know, those can catch on fire. Um, or you can accidentally put diesel in a gasoline uh, vehicle, which I have done, and I've had other people do. Uh, so really be careful of that because that's really hazardous to your job. Um, talk about flammable gases, and then that's just a few things. But the reality is, is there's a place to find out about all these things. And it's called the MSDS log. And we have two of these. Not only do we have a physical form as required by law, but we also have in our uh, your Google Drive folder uh, that will be for the 2020 vintage. Um, there will be a link to the MSDS sheets. So you can just click on there and you can we keep all of our MSDS sheets in digital form as well as physical form. I'll show you in the cellar where we keep the log. And the reason why you need to know that is if there is a new chemical or something that you haven't worked with before uh, or you accidentally ingest something, you need to be able to go find that um, that log and that that chemical in the MSDS sheets and it'll tell you what to do if you uh, interact with it. It'll tell you whether you need to rinse your eyes out um, or whether you need to call poison control or, or what you need to do. So know where that MSDS binder is and, and we'll show you that in the cellar. Um, and then when we're working with hazardous things, we wanna talk about personal protective equipment. And we all are becoming very well, well aware of one type of personal protective equipment where we're wearing masks uh, very regularly and that's to protect us against an airborne uh, pathogen. So we also wanna talk about other things we might wanna use in the cellar. Uh, you wanna protect your eyes, you got safety goggles and, and um, a face shield if we need to be using some heavy chemical. Uh, we need to protect your body if we need to. If we're gonna, again, if we're gonna be using heavy chemical, gloves, boots, smock, or maybe a rain suit. In general, in a cellar, most of the time, all you're going to require are some sort of goggles. I definitely recommend waterproof boots or shoes of some kind. And occasionally we're gonna need gloves. Um, and then if we're working in rain or water a whole lot, we might want a rain suit, but um, generally gloves and boots suffice for the most part in a cellar uh, to keep us from uh, running into big problems. Now notice there's a hard hat there. In small winery scenarios where you're working at a mom and pop shop where the tanks are only a few feet tall, uh, maybe eight, 10 feet tall, a hard hat probably isn't necessary. But if you do go work in a larger winery where you're 20, 30, 40 foot tall tanks, maybe 50, 60, even 100 feet tall, um, uh, I definitely recommend uh, hard hats. And the reason for that is uh, when I was working in New Zealand, 
there was this uh, guy who was an Australian seller guy, and he'd always worn a hard hat because in Australia, it's required law that you always wear a hard hat. And all the New Zealanders were laughing at this guy, Tony, for wearing his hard hat. And uh, sure enough, there was a uh, giant crescent wrench, or what they call it a spanner wrench, probably weighed about a pound and a half, two pounds. Somebody kicked it off a 30 foot high uh, catwalk and it fell and hit Tony in the head. And it cracked his uh, hard hat in half. And if he had not had that on his head, Tony probably wouldn't be alive. So uh, quickly after that, you notice that uh, around that winery, everybody started wearing hard hats. So uh, maybe not something we require in our small winery scenario, but if you're working at a large tank farm, highly, highly recommend uh, looking into wearing some sort of uh, head protection. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, chemical hazards. Um, number one, uh, carbon dioxide. This is the number one killer of winery workers. Uh, you hear about stories every single year. Uh, the asphyxiation happens really, really quickly. It's produced by yeast. I mean, yeast basically takes sugar and they turn it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's basically what they do. Uh, and we use a lot of CO2. It's very common. And we hear about people getting uh, in trouble all the time. When I was in New Zealand, famous winemaker leaned in a tank, a giant tank to grab a gasket and got his belt caught for just a brief moment, took a couple of breaths. They found him with his boots hanging out of the tank. Um, and in larger operations, you're going to want to wear a CO2 meter. And then if you're ever getting in a tank, always make sure you pair up. And why this is important is, say you ever were to have somebody who fell in a tank of fermenting wine. So you're up top of a big tank, somebody's leaning over and they fall in the fermenting tank. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is run down the stairs and yank the door open on the tank. CO2 is heavy. Carbon dioxide is a heavy gas. You rip the door open and you watch the wine run out all over the floor as fast as you can. And the reason you want to do that is the tank is going to empty, the CO2 is going to drain, and then you're going to be able to grab the person and pull them out through the man door. Um, if you do it a different way, um, like you reach over the top of the tank and try to pull the person out, the CO2 is in there. And if you go in to breathe it, you'll breathe it, you'll fall in the tank too. Um, a friend of mine was working in Belgium and uh, actually Bulgaria, sorry, in Bulgaria. And they found uh, three brothers all dead in the bottom of fermenter. And it looked like one had fallen in, got overwhelmed. The other one went in after the other one and got overwhelmed. And then the third one went in and they all passed away together. Um, so this happens pretty regularly in the wine industry. And so be very, very cautious of uh, carbon dioxide, the potential of carbon dioxide poisoning. Our cellar does have monitors built into the walls. If it gets too high, it'll alarm and we'll have to leave. But uh, generally, we don't produce enough carbon dioxide for it to be too worrisome. And besides, most of our ferments are going to be outside this year. And here's an example right here. Winemaker dies after falling in a vat of vino. Um, yeah, she did. 25 years old, leaned over a tank, fell in, toast. Uh, I'm going to show you lots of examples like this as we go through. So I talk about chemical hazards and look at acids. So one of the things we want to talk about in terms of acids are weak acids. Now, weak acids are ones that aren't particularly aggressive, means they don't, you know, lend any immediate burning. Uh, citric, tartaric, and malic and acetic acids are used regularly in the winery. Uh, generally, we use uh, tartaric and acetic as a rinse agent to rinse off strong bases, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But then we have tartaric and malic, which just exist in, um, in grape juice in general, and, and along with small amounts of citric acid. Um, they're not test terribly aggressive initially, but after a few months in the cellar of your hands just being bathed in this, um, they can tend to crack your, your hands, which doesn't sound all that terrible at first, except for when you realize that you're working around a microbiological soup known as wine. And there's a lot of opportunities for infections and things to happen. So um, uh, although you're using these acids pretty regularly, it's a good idea to rinse your hands off regularly. We should be washing our hands regularly anyway. And then uh, generally at night, go home and uh, put a little bit of lotion on as well. Um, well, those are not a big deal in the short term. There are long-term exposure issues that can lead to some, some cracking of your skin. Strong acids like hydrochloric and sulfuric acid are commonly used in large uh, production wineries, especially sulfuric as a rinse agent, because they're going to be rinsing off stronger uh, 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 bases. So they tend to use uh, strong acids such as sulfuric acid. The reason I show you this is this is what uh, sulfuric acid will do to you if you get it on your face. And uh, a girl that I worked with in uh, New Zealand actually got it on her. This is, a, this is a different sulfuric acid burn to show you just how bad it can be. It only takes a few, uh, few seconds for it to get on your skin to burn you this bad. So uh, we won't be using this in the cellar. So no worries on our end, but it definitely does exist in the wine industry. 
We're talking about strong bases uh, as well. Uh, sodium hydroxide, also known as caustic soda or sodium hydroxide. We use it for cleaning commonly. We don't use it, again, at College Cellars. Uh, we use a little bit weaker uh, base. Uh, that is my hand on the left-hand side, or the right-hand side there, um, and that is uh, burn. That is what happens when you uh, get your hand in sodium hydroxide for too long. And um, sodium hydroxide can burn you, and it turns your fat into soap, and then you kind of rot from the inside out. It's pretty awesome. Um, the downside to it is, is you don't notice it right when you get it. It takes about a day or two for it to show up. So you don't notice until all of a sudden you're itching and burning by then it's too late. Um, if you do happen to get sodium hydroxide on you, uh, what you want to do is neutralize it with an acid as quickly as possible, such as citric acid uh, or acetic acid, and then rinse your hand uh, aggressively. And then also, uh, you get one drop of sodium hydroxide in your eye and you're going to lose your vision. So um, again, not something we're going to be using in the cellar, but uh, in bigger cellars and larger wineries that use more aggressive chemical, um, use that you know personal protective equipment regularly to protect yourself from this type of uh, burn. All right, sulfur dioxide. This is something that we use in the wine industry as well. This is an inhalant um, used in virtually all wineries. Uh, and in small amounts, sulfur dioxide is absolutely fabulous. So let's make sure we talk about what sulfur dioxide does because in low doses, it is fantastic for a whole host of things in the wine industry. I know there's a lot of, uh, every 10 years, there's press about how sulfite's bad for you and how we need to get rid of using it in wine and then we stop using it and then we have all sorts of infections and terrible things that happen to wine and then all of a sudden the, the movement goes away. And it goes back and forth and has been for as long as I've been in the industry. Um, but uh, it's important that you use it judiciously and we use it in really small amounts. Now realize that even a, a case of wine will have uh, about the same amount of sulfur dioxide in it as one dried apricot from the store. They just don't have to label it. Also, like white grape juice and things like that that you buy at the store uh, have tremendous amounts of sulfur dioxide in it. But for a bunch of bizarre reasons, we, we have to label it the wine industry. So although sulfur dioxide is very good in very small amounts in the wine industry, when you use it improperly or you're around it really frequently and you're not using that protective equipment like a mask or something to keep it away from you or you're, you're mixing it improperly and you breathe it regularly, you can have some issues. So it comes in a lot of different ways. Primarily at the school, we're gonna be using potassium metabisulfite, so a powder. Then we also have a stock solution and a dispenser that will dispense it out um, at a rate into uh, a liquid so you won't have to smell it. And then we also have sulfur gas and wicks, wicks and we'll talk about how we use those um, as a sanitizing agent in barrels when we get to barrel maintenance. But um, sulfur dioxide is a very commonly used thing in the wine industry. Um, it's a dangerous inhalant, especially for people with asthma, asthma, and it combines with water in your lungs to, to form sulfuric acid, and it'll burn from the inside out. Um, I've been in a fight with this and ended up in the hospital because of it. I was uh, young and dumb and uh, was around it all day long. I was unaware of the the ramifications and consequences. And I breathed uh, barrels, I had brand new barrels and I was filling them with wine and they had been gassed with sulfur dioxide. And I filled about a hundred barrels of wine uh, that were full of sulfur dioxide. And I was just in a building, enclosed, breathing SO2 all day. And the next day my lungs just started to hurt terribly. And I went in to get a CAT scan and my lungs came back showing all this scar tissue. Um, and my, the doctor asked me how long I'd been a chronic, you know, heavy smoker. And I said, I, I don't smoke, I haven't smoked in years. And he goes, well, you got a lot of damage to your lungs. And primarily that was from the sulfur dioxide. And it took me years to stop having uh, bronchi bronchial issues uh, from it. So um, something to be careful of. Uh, we do now require uh, you know, pesticide handling permits. And I'll, I'll tell you how to mitigate SO2 uh, you know, dangers as much as I can. But reality is, is that uh, sulfur dioxide can be an issue. Uh, just be careful. Again, it's not something you get one whiff of. It's you know no big deal. It's that chronic exposure issue that can lead to long-term health issues. All right, now we talk about physical hazards. So after you get past the chemical ones that can burn you and hurt you, um, let's talk about physical hazards. The, the primary one we run into in the wine industry are tripping hazards because there's lots of hoses on the floor. The floors are wet. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a second. We have electrical hazards because we're plugging high voltage equipment into high powered things. And we have ionized water all around. Remember we were talking about cleaning with sodium hydroxide and sodium that ionizes the water and allows the water to conduct electricity really, really well. Then we also have slip and fall issues. We have heights where we're up on ladders or we're on stools, we're on steps. Um, we also have equipment hazards um, like forklifts 
if you get an opportunity uh, on YouTube, go type into YouTube, uh, German forklift training video. Um, if you're into eight bad 80s horror movies, it's hilarious. If you're not into that kind of thing, don't watch it, but it's hilarious. And then also fatigue is a big deal. And in wine industry, we, we are uh, an agricultural job where we're working long hours. We're spending hours and hours a day in a cellar, maybe 12, 14, 16 hours, and you get tired. When you get tired, you make mistakes. And I would be willing to bet you that 80% to 90% of all the accidents I've had where I've been injured, I've broken something, I've hurt something, I damaged a building or had a pallet of wine slip off the front of the forklift, they've all happened after a 10 or 12 hour day. It's at the end of the day and I'm trying to go home and you make a mistake. And I also want to say that yourself, you know, you can always make mistakes. And a lot of times you're not thinking through, through clearly and you do something stupid like this gentleman here. So I want to talk about uh, protection. How do we protect ourselves against physical hazard? Well, number one, we eliminate the hazard. Get rid of it. So if you have a dangerous machine, get rid of it. Well, we have a dangerous machine down on the crush pad. Uh, it's our bladder press. I'm going to show you it. Uh, we're going to use it, this vintage, um, but I want to show it to you because there's a reasonable chance you'll end up using one in the industry. And so I've got to show you how to work with a machine that can kill you. Um, so how to be safe and how to work around it. Um, then we might want to substitute that hazard with a safer alternative. So guess what? We have a safer alternative. We have a we have a bladder press that's our membrane press that is much safer. It has emergency stops. It has protections on it to keep you from getting hurt. Um, so we can substitute it with a more modern, less dangerous example. Another thing we can do is isolate that hazard from anyone can be harmed, and we do that. So even though we have this bladder press that can you know mess you up pretty bad, we make sure that we keep everybody three feet away from it. Um, another thing we can do is put controls to reduce the risk. In, in our case, we have kind of a cage around it to keep people from falling into it. Then uh, finally, uh, you know, we work into the last little bits. We use administrative controls where we'll train you how not to use it. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to show you how to use this press so that you can't get, well, that you hopefully won't get caught up in it. Uh, and a lot of that just requires that safe behavior, that safe action, the safe self-awareness that you're working around a potentially, you know, deadly piece of equipment. And then finally, we want to use personal protective equipment if we have to. Um, so that's kind of the final step. But this is the hierarchy. So the first thing we want to do is get rid of it. If we can't get rid of it, we want to substitute it with something that's better. If we can't do that, we want to isolate it. If we can't do that, we want to use some engineering, something around it to keep you from getting caught in it. Um, and then if we can't do that, we'll train you how to use it. Um, and then finally, if all those things uh, fail, we'll put some, something on you that'll keep you from getting uh, injured by that piece of ma uh, machinery. So I want to talk about those physical hazards, tripping hazards. This is the number one cause of injury in wineries. Uh, lots of ankle injuries, lots of wrist injuries, knee injuries uh, from slipping over things. This is actually a cellar I worked in. This was uh, the main manifold in the middle of uh, the cellar. And all of these hoses are going to different tanks somewhere. Um, and what was really interesting is, is that if you notice in the middle, there's all these little valves right in the middle. Well, we would get a call uh, on a walkie-talkie. We might be you know, 100, 200 yards away, that it was right now was the time to do a press cut. And we had to go sprinting across a wet, slippery floor to get to that valve, to close it and open another one and jump over these, uh, this hose, almost like some sort of an obstacle course in order to close the valve in time to get that press cut to move somewhere else. And needless to say, I slipped and fell numerous times, but fortunately I was still young enough to bounce. Uh, and many employees did. And so um, I'm not sure if they've, you know, engineered around this at this point in time, but, you know, it looked like a big pile of spaghetti. And now I want to also, you know, recognize something that these hoses are not small in diameter. They're four inches in diameter. Um, so, you know, these are pretty big uh, obstacles to jump over. And uh, so, you know, this can happen. And even in, in big wineries, uh, small wineries and otherwise, there's lots of tripping hazards around. Uh, electricity and water is really dangerous, um, and we're going to be working with it. You're going to be hooking up all kinds of high-powered electrical equipment, and you're going to have wet shoes on, and you're going to have wet hands, and you're going to be turning it on and off. Um, and so one of the things I thought was really interesting is my dad uh, was really insistent about keeping plugs off the floor. Well, if a plug's on the floor and the electricity jumps into the water, it jumps straight to the ground. But my dad would always hang it up on a tank, and he just couldn't stop doing it, so he would hang up the connection on a tank. Well, one day it was leaning up against a tank. The electricity was running through the tank and I leaned against the tank. 
and I got really lit up. So um, needless to say, we use very tightly sealed specialty uh, plugs on all of our heavy equipment uh, to keep that from happening in our cellar. Uh, but again, something to be uh, aware of. All right, other hazards, pitch points, chains, pumps, and augers. Augers are the worst. And we'll talk about lockout tag out here in a second and why you need to do that. Um, but I talked to an insurance agent that worked at large you know, wineries and they said, what's the main thing that people really get hurt on? And they said, augers. God, we hate augers. Um, and there's always an opportunity for something to get caught in an auger. And then what happens is, is somebody goes in to pull that thing out, the auger starts back up and you get pulled into it. And um, that does happen. And, and to give you an illustration of how that can happen, I was working at a pretty large winery in Australia and all of a sudden the auger jams up. And in that process, there was a, a, a bicycle that had been machine harvested. Yeah, a bicycle uh, into uh, a, a receival bin and the bicycle jammed up the auger. We had to lock out, tag out the auger. We closed it. We dug out all of the fruit, and then we found the bicycle and pulled it out, removed it from the auger, and then unlocked the machine and started it back up. Um, but a lot of times, if people don't turn it off properly, that can happen. Uh, the other picture I have here, this is at the University of Adelaide. This is uh, the rotary fermenters. And what these fermenters do is you fill them with grapes, and then you set a program, and every hour or two um, or four or whatever, the tanks will rotate in order to, to re-immerse the cap. So this whole big barrel rolls over. Well. A student that was there just before, you know, kind of right as I got there, he decided to override all of the protection things so he could be right next to his fermenter as it rolled over. Well, as it rolled over, these, these fermenters, in order to uh, allow the carbon dioxide to escape, there's a big piece of metal, it's like on a cam, that burps the uh, fermenter as it rotates back upright. And that piece of metal is about a big round as, you know, it was about, um, you know, an inch and a half wide by about a half an inch thick and just a square piece of metal. Well, he was leaning against holding himself up as it rotated over and it was locked out. And that piece of metal that was, you know, half an inch blunt and uh, thick and about an inch and a half wide went directly between his radial and his ulna and his wrist. And then he screamed, somebody hit stop. But at that point in time, and by the way, these rotate these uh, these fermenters only rotate one way. They don't rotate backwards. So he's pinned, stuck with a piece of metal caught between his radial and ulna, uh, and pinned to the machine um, until the fire brigade could come and uh, cut him out. And then they got him cut out and got him all patched up. But he overrode safety equipment in order to do that. And so these are things that I've seen. These are things I've been a part of. And uh, fortunately, it hasn't happened to me. I did almost lose my fingers to uh, uh, a uh, 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 hopper outside. Uh, we can talk about that in person sometime. But um, reality is, is these things are around. There's always potential for danger. So again, uh, be safe. So here's the thing. is So say you're working in a winery. And I want to put this in a, a real sense. What happens if all of a sudden you're down there, you're working, you got a punch down tool and there's an auger or just something and you drop it in the machine? What do you do? The first thing you do is let it go. You can tell I am the father of a young lady because I have seen this show plenty of times. Um, but the first thing you do is let it go and then you hit the emergency stop. That's why emergency stops exist resist the urge to go in after it. So the first thing you want to do is you want to reach after it. Don't do it. The first thing you want to do is turn and hit the e-stop. Once you hit the e-stop, then you can worry about getting it out. So remember, you drop something in a piece of equipment, just let it happen. Pieces of equipment are easily replaceable uh, compared to arms and legs and fingers and lives. And here you go. Here's a great example. It happens not so long ago. A uh, winemaker loses right hand in a harvest accident. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, don't uh, go in after things. Just clean it a crusher to stimmer and got his arm stuck in a machine. And so this is why you let things go. And if you are going to clean something, you got to lock it out and tag it out. So say we're going to go ahead and uh, clean a piece of equipment where somebody actually has to get inside. If we do that, what we do is we'll get a padlock 
and you turn off the machinery and you notice on all of our machinery that someone could get in or be around, there's a clip on that machinery. There's a hole where you can put a padlock through it and lock that machine closed. So you lock out the machine, then there's usually only one key. It's on a key ring that goes around whoever's neck that's going into the machine to clean it. So that way it can't get turned on unless someone actually, you know, unless the person that's, you know, getting into that equipment can turn it back on. So we lock it out and we tag it out. And that way we prevent the unexpected energization, startup or release of stored energy during equipment servicing, inspection and maintenance. And why is this important? Because a friend of mine, Pete Hedges, just about died. Went into work one morning and uh, this happened. I'm gonna read this to you. I know this is just a dramatic reading in the middle of a stupid YouTube video, but it's important to be able to understand why this is important. His life was hanging by a thread. The self-made man didn't have a prayer. In other words, a heartbeat or two, his days would be cut short. I thought I've had a pretty good life. My wife will be okay. My kids all have jobs, Pete Hedges of Richland said, as he recalled October 2011 morning when he knew he only had moments to live. For the Hedges family winemaker and general manager, the crisp pre-dawn red, dawn on red mountain was just beginning. It was just getting light, the athletic 62-year-old said. I got into the wine press. It's outside because you need room to use a forklift to put in the grapes, and I couldn't see very well. Pete was intent on checking a patch that he'd plied on the wine press's rubber bladder, a mechanism that compresses to squeeze juice from the grapes. A man already stressed by 70 to 80 hour harvest work week, Pete found frustration when the electronic control wouldn't rotate the hot dog shaped cylinder. For access, its doors needed to be parallel to the catwalk, but the doors were parallel, parallel to the ground instead, and the power had not been turned off. It's not rotating anyway, so I stuck my head in and my lower body's out, feet on the ground, Pete said as the scene unfolding in faint light. Leaning around one of the metal screens, I lifted myself up like on parallel bars to get in further to see the repair. Suddenly, the alarm on the controller sounded like a loud and clear warning. That was the moment of sheer terror because I knew it was going to start rotating and I knew what was going to happen, Pete said, recalling the horrific reality. The door hits me on the back and the sheet metal is catching me on the front. My hands and arms are inside of it. It's like a big rolling pin. It started breaking vertebrae and I could hear it like a big stick breaking. All of his thoughts of his family melded with the sound of crushing bone. The safety cord on the outside of the drum spun into sight. In a desperate reach, Pete's fingers found their mark. I needed to yell, but my lungs were punctured, so all I could do was a loud whisper, Help! Pete said, aware that there's a 10-inch concrete wall between him and his crew inside the building. Fortunately, some of the vineyard workers are cleaning up the lugs as we pick grapes, and one of the guys had walked over and turned the water spigot on and saw me. Pete remembers the wail of the ambulance, the backboard strapped to his crushed body, and the intense pain. Okay, fair enough, right? Well, guess what? Here's another one. Winemaker crushed to death by a wine press. All right, you see, you, you getting the point here? Um, this happens. And again, let's talk about unsafe behavior. Let's talk about the things that we can do. We're tired, we're fatigued. Maybe there's alcohol involved, maybe there isn't. There's lots of opportunities to end up injured in this industry. So uh, be smart, be self-aware, sleep as much as you can and take care of yourself because we don't need to have you be another statistic. So let's talk about some other hazards. Well, how about exploding tanks? There's a fabulous video on the internet. Hopefully I'll try to find all these and, and link them in the, the comments section um, where uh, there's an exploding, some exploding tanks. Sometimes people uh, close uh, fermenters and seal them while the yeast are going and they can explode spectacularly. Other workers, realize you're working around other people that may not be uh, paying attention. Um, they can get you uh, injured as well. Um, and that's how I almost lost my fingers from another worker around me. Strain from lifting, I've almost uh, hurt myself. I have hurt myself um, being a lifetime power lifter uh, and uh, finally getting a little bit old in my days. Um, I've definitely injured myself trying to you know, pick up a full barrel of wine or something like that. I don't do that anymore. Uh, tired, falling objects, poor engineering. Uh, and then I wanna talk about imploding tanks because this is uh, really only hazardous to your employment. And this happens pretty regularly. And here's some pictures I've taken from around uh, around town and around other places where I've been, uh, where people don't open the tank before they pump out of it. So you start pumping out of the tank, the tank is sealed, it will create a vacuum and you'll implode the tank. Um, I highly recommend as you tour large wineries to go look for the imploding tank. You will find them everywhere. We've imploded two of the tanks downstairs, which we've re-exploded. Um, it can happen, it does happen. Uh, and it guarantee it is a good way to get yourself canned. Uh, ha ha. Um, and now this is one that's a little different. 
So this is a aerial view of Wira Wira Winery. Now this is an example of poor engineering. So this is one that no one could have expected. So this is a brand new tank farm that they had built over an old cellar. An engineering firm had come in, they had verified how strong everything was, and they started putting tanks on top of this old cellar and they were filling it. Well, my friend Angus, remember the beginning slide of this thing, was on top of this tank farm when it fell. And he ended up puncturing a couple of lungs, broke his back, uh, everything else. And we called him the tank surfer because there's no reason he should have ever lived. But when this collapsed, they were filling tanks. He was on top. They were filling with Shiraz and the Shiraz exploded. And he fell in such a way that he literally rode a wave of Shiraz out. Um, and that's how he survived. And so we called him the tank surfer. And he was going to never be able to work in the wine industry ever again. Um, but uh, fortunately, he did okay. And here he is now, obviously not learning his lesson. He's the gentleman on the right-hand side. Um, but at least they've got someone up there with a vent fan blowing air into uh, some tanks as they're having a shovel out con competition. Now realize in Australia, it is a uh, natural, a national sort of competition to uh, strip down to your underwear and see how quickly you can uh, shovel out a fermenter. Um, so anyway, it looks like Angus is doing quite well and has uh, recovered from his uh, tank surfer incident uh, 10 years down the road. And one other realistic hazard, we're in the alcohol industry. And I think in a lot of ways we become desensitized to the amount of alcohol being consumed around us. And sometimes I think it's like a moth to a flame. A lot of people are attracted to the wine industry because it'll allow them to uh, become socially acceptable you know, alcoholics. And it's a tricky line to walk. And I, I wanna be really honest with you about my usage and about you know challenges I've had over the years. You know, I've been in the industry for a long time and there's a lot of times when I just have to sort of take a break and take a step back. Uh, and then also I monitor how much I drink pretty regularly. I write it down every night how much I can consume because, because what can happen is you can start trending up. And as you trend up, you start to become sort of desensitized to how much ethanol you're putting in your system. And, and that can eventually lead to all sorts of health problems. And also realize we're in the wine industry, we're around other people that drink. And when you see the quantities being consumed, uh, sometimes you can rationalize it and it's not okay to do that. So very realistically, keep a log, keep that idea of self-awareness of individual responsibility, because it's up to you. There's no one around you that's going to be telling you not to drink or, you know, keep you away from drinking. That's going to be up to you. And you're going to have access to pretty much unlimited amounts of alcohol as you enter the industry. And so, uh, you know, if you own your own label, especially, there's just no limit to the amount you can have. And if you ever want to talk to me about it, you ever want to come in my office and, you know, you think you're having an issue um, or don't be afraid someday if I think you're having an issue and I pull you in the office because we've had to have conversations and hard conversations with students before. And again, I'm not trying to dissuade you because the alcohol industry as a whole, the wine industry as a whole is an absolute blast. But again, this idea of personal responsibility, personal safety is very, very important. And we've got to stay that way. We've got to stay on top of that. And so the um, last thing we need to do is have you be uh, another statistic. So make sure to take care of yourself. And now we've got another level of personal responsibility that I didn't even think we had to talk about. But now we've got to add another thing to it. Um, you know, we've lost winemakers this year uh, due to COVID-19. And, um, and, and I don't want another statistic. So I think this is you know, something that we can easily work around. Um, you know, the, the research is pretty strong. If we wear masks and sanitize our hands and, you know, work outside and keep distance, I think that we can minimize uh, transmission, you know, uh, through our cellars. Uh, but I think that that just requires, again, that personal responsibility that not only are you concerned about your own well-being and, and, and primarily, you, you know, you should be, but at the same time, your actions can impact other people. And since, you know, depending on the research, somewhere between 20, 40, maybe even more percentage of people are totally asymptomatic of, of this uh, virus that can hammer some people really, really hard on the back end. You know, you've got to take responsibility on your shoulders to take care of those around us. And the last thing we want to do is start watching some of the, the founders of our industry who are now getting up there in years uh, start to disappear because of our carelessness. So again, this is that idea of personal responsibility. You need to take care of not only yourself, but everybody around you. And that's part of being a community. And that's one of the things that the Walla Walla wine industry does better than anybody else 
is that we are a community. We take care of each other. That's important for us to do. And uh, we all need to take uh, action in that respect. And it's pretty easy to do. Wash your hands, wear a mask, piece of cake. Um, and then when it comes down to drinking, again, spitting is okay. Be responsible. When you're at work and you're around alcohol, you can drink too much. And the reason why I show you this is that as a wine professional, spit. Um, as you're tasting at work, spit. You may taste two, three, four hundred wines in a day. If you swallow them a quarter ounce at a time, 400 wines, you drank 100 ounces of wine. You just drank four bottles of wine. And that can be really, really hazardous to your health. Not only your health, but the people's health around you. And why is this important to me? Well, here's why. This is my dad's Jeep. Um, my dad got hit by a drunk driver on his 10th DUI, 10th time, obviously an alcoholic, uh, which is a recognized uh, disease. Um, and he hit my dad and actually ended up in the back of my dad's car. And why this is important is that um, my dad ended up with a closed head injury. And my dad was a juggernaut of small business. Uh, he'd done really well in the printing industry. And suddenly my dad couldn't read anymore. My dad couldn't write anymore. My dad didn't do math anymore. My dad could still talk. He looked like dad, still talked like dad. He wasn't physically injured, but had a closed head injury uh, due to this impact. So this is something I take very seriously. I take very personally. And um, I think it's important that um, we, we all bind our P's and Q's because not only will a DUI just ruin your career, you could do this to someone. So just be careful, be safe. By all means, have a few glasses of wine when you're at home. Uh, by all means, take an Uber. It's super cheap. It's easy to do that. Heck, it's Walla Walla. It's small. Walk home. Um, but the last thing you want to do is end up hurting somebody else uh, in, in, in your, your career by, by, again, ignoring personal responsibility. Our rules, this is it. If you don't know what it is, ask. That's what we're here for. Um, you got to wear closed-toed shoes in the cellar and in the vineyard. If I see you in flip-flops, I see you in sandals, I see you in open-toed shoes, you're going to go home. Deal with it. Um, be fresh and aware. Sleep well. Don't go out. Don't get drunk. Don't get hungover. Keep yourself fresh and aware. There's a lot of things happening. Um, appropriate clothing is to be worn. Don't wear really, really baggy shirts and jeans. Uh, they're catch hazards. The last thing you want to do is get caught up in a machine. I also really recommend against wearing button-up shirts. They will get caught in bird net and other things like crazy. Um, so really try to you know stick to, to shirts without buttons. Um, phones. Keep phones away from equipment. Keep away from wines. Um, uh, it's been interesting. One of my friends was studying uh, uh, different things being found in wine, and he's noticed over the last 20 years that the lithium content in wine has gone up like 20 fold. And he's trying to figure out why that is. Well, it's all the phones falling in equipment and then getting ground up. It's the lithium ion batteries that are breaking down and we're seeing an increase in lithium. Well, maybe we'll have fewer depressed winemakers. I don't know uh, because of that, but uh, we don't want to end up getting phones in our equipment. So keep your phones away from the equipment and also keep them out of shirt pockets. This is the other reason I say don't to wear uh, button up shirts because they have pockets and then you'll be tempted to put your phone in your shirt pocket. Then you bend over and things get, uh, get they fall into the bin. Um, and then some other things to think about is it's advised to, you know, remove all jewelry. My wife knows I love her and she knows during vintage, I don't wear a wedding ring. Um, and it's not because during uh, vintage, I'm suddenly not married anymore. It just happens to be that all those chemical hazards I talked about will grow underneath my finger. And you, when you pull off your ring, you'll also pull off a bunch of your skin. So uh, I recommend uh, at this uh, during vintage, if you're going to have your hands and lots of things, uh, make sure to remove uh, any wedding bands and things like that. Um, and then also another thing to be aware of uh, in terms of jewelry, um, my Fitbit, which I wear religiously even during vintage, I have a stainless band on it. Um, and that stainless band is there for a very significant reason because it's inert and also it breathes and a lot of things don't get underneath it, uh, that cause long-term uh, issues. So, um, just something else to be aware of. If you can get a stainless band for your watch, if you're dead set on wearing it, that's a good idea. Um, again, tasting is okay. Drinking is not spit advised. And then I'll put this link in the uh, YouTube comment section. This is what happens when you drink at work. Uh, don't do it. So uh, here's your review questions. These are things you'll be likely to find on a quiz. Um, talk about the killer in the wine industry, which is carbon dioxide. Uh, some common cleaning chemicals that can blind you. Uh, what you do if a bicycle gets stuck in a receivable bin. 
Um, and then before pumping wine out of a tank, what you should do, vent it. Um, and uh, if you need to get in a tank, how should you proceed? Make sure you've got a partner, somebody with you, and you vent that tank really, really well. Some references for you. And uh, we'll talk to you over about uh, winery safety uh, as we move forward. Cheers.